Fact is, women held powerful leadership roles in Christian history and in the Bible. Now, female leadership in the church is a particular hot button for some folks, and because the Bible is a multivocal work constructed by many authors and editors over a 1,300-year period, you're going to find many different ideas about female leadership within it. But a number of books of the Bible do clearly highlight the significant roles women have played in both civil and spiritual leadership. And to ignore that and only focus on two or three specific verses referring to specific churches in specific regions to apply as blanket statements to diminish the role of women overall, is really shortchanging the contribution of women in leadership. And look, there's no getting around it. When you look at the Bible, it's obviously patriarchal. There's, you know, that's just the way it is, especially in the Old Testament. But that's what makes a few things very remarkable because there are instances where God elevated women to significant roles defying culture. I mean, believed by some scholars to be one of the earliest writing slash stories of the Bible is Exodus 15, often called the Song of Miriam. Miriam being the sister of Moses and Aaron and is specifically named as a prophet. Also very ancient is Judges 4 through 5 about Deborah, who was named as not only a prophet, a spiritual leader, but she was also a judge, the civil leader of Israel. And she also led men into battle, overturning the cultural standards of the day. There's Esther, and if it wasn't for her stepping up for her people before Ahasuerus, the entire Jewish people group would have been slaughtered. And Huldah's prophetic voice in 2 Chronicles 34 highly influenced King Josiah. In the New Testament, it was Anna, a named prophetess in the temple, who was the first human to proclaim Jesus as the Savior of the world in Luke 2.38. It was women who financed Jesus' ministry, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Susanna. A woman was the first evangelist to non-Jews, the woman at the well. It was a woman who was the first announcer of the resurrected Christ. Phoebe is named as a deacon in Romans 16.1. Unia was recognized as outstanding among the apostles in Romans 16.7. And named women like Lydia, Chloe, Nympha, and Aphia all led house churches. Prisca or Priscilla was involved in church planning, was a named teacher to Apollos, a fellow, by the way, who became a dynamic leader in the early church, taught by a woman. And not only that, when introducing Priscilla in Romans 16.5, Paul named her first before her husband, which was very rare in Greco-Roman culture. We have Tabitha leading in ministry in Acts 9.36. A Mary is named as a worker for the gospel in Asia. Tryphena and Tryphosa are named as Paul's fellow workers. There's Persis, Julia, Nearest his sister. I mean, the list goes on. Women in the Bible named as powerful leaders, challenging the notion that women's roles in ministry should be restricted. Acts 2, Ephesians 4, and 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 11 emphasize that spiritual gifts are distributed regardless of gender. And this was very dynamic in patriarchal culture. In fact, we have a patriarchal culture having its very ideas challenged by this early New Testament church. And early opponents of the new religion of Christianity would claim that it was but a religion made up of the foolish, dishonorable, and stupid, only slaves, women, and little children. That's Celsus, by the way. Because women were flocking to this new faith because there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus, Galatians 3.28. But then you have verses like 1 Corinthians 14.34-35 and 1 Timothy 2.11-15, which are often taken out of cultural context to restrict women's roles. But in context, we see that in 1 Corinthians, Paul is addressing orderly worship, not silencing women altogether, but suggesting he was correcting disruptive behavior in that church, not prohibiting women from speaking for all time. In the case of Timothy, when understanding the socio-religious context of Ephesus, whose converts were coming out of a matriarchal-styled worship, the author's intent was to restore order and counteract teachings prevalent in that area, not to impose a blanket prohibition on women teaching for all time, especially in light of the leadership of women in Acts and Romans. There are women leaders in the beautiful multivocal work we call the Bible, whether you like it or not. And their voices have been silenced. And we should ask why and why certain people think it's necessary to keep them quiet. For far too long, because of taking a few verses out of cultural context, 50% of a faith's people have been made to feel like they are less than because of being born a certain way. Not by their choices, but by their birth. 
And I can't help but believe that God's heart and God's character and God's nature and God's beauty is bigger than that. I sure wish his children's hearts were. God bless. See you soon.